Jai Guru, everyone. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. And welcome to chapter three, part five. A very interesting end to the chapter. So we're going to jump right on in with a lovely, lovely opening I found. Uh, I'm going to read it out because it's really beautiful. It says, Pranabhananda's face with, was suffused with divine light. The peace of another world entered my heart. All fear had fled. I mean, what a way to start an episode, right? And I was quite interested, actually, with this suffusion of divine light. And when you read this, did you think uh, it's a light that could be visibly seen or one that was more inwardly felt? Um, what do you think, Mike? The first thing I did is I grabbed my dictionary to look up what suffuse means. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's, um, I, I read a, the German translation and I was like, wow, this is actually, this is actually very nice. So it, it gave me a picture. Like, I feel like that's what Guruji often does. He uses words that aren't used that often to paint pictures, right? And that's what I saw. And I suddenly saw this kind of um, divine light, kind of um, almost like an extra layer over his face. And um, this, is, this adds something to to this whole scene and the way I can imagine it when I read it. Mm. He really paints a picture, doesn't he, with words? And they're so precise. I know I say this a lot, but it really does, like you say, it adds to the story, doesn't it? And I love that that light came from that recounting of the story as well. Uh, it obviously did something to him, reminding himself of that event. Um, yeah, Priyank, what do you feel? Yeah, so this this was at the end of a quite a long and deep reflection on Lady Marshai, on his uh, greatness, as we discussed in the previous episode. <clears throat> so it was like the consequence of that divine um, kind of experience that he relived. So you might say he, he inwardly he retook the notion of uh, the Hiri Masha. And then as a result, his aura was beaming, um, which is what I think Mukunda is seeing here. Um, so I was just wondering, do you, some people you kind of see like a spiritual glow, like this aura that Yoganda is describing? And it's so nice when you see it, isn't it? Mm. So nice to um, interact with them. Um, such people chris i have a intuition call it what you will a feeling that it's more visible to some people than others so i think it actually has some dependency on the receiver of the vision of the sight as well as the you know the individual that might be exuding this kind of light or this presence because it's maybe you know he, he says it himself he says the peace of another world entered my heart. So maybe this, the light of another world is is kind of coming in as well into this material plane, this physical, more gross plane. So maybe Yogananda being Yogananda is able to almost, you know, see this divine light a little bit clearer than maybe others. And it might speak to how you could walk past a holy person and maybe not quite see them. So your receptiveness might play a strong part in this as well. Mm, yeah. Chris is um, spot on with the. I think you need to be in tune yourself to see this kind of. I. It reminds me sometimes when I had a long meditation and I look at the guru picture that's on my altar. I can't sometimes see like a glow there, or, or it feels different. It feels more alive, and I think maybe it's it's a similar phenomenon. Yeah, I I think very much that I would be able to walk past a person that's someone like Yogananda and miss it <laughs> I don't think my perception is that keen but often I think it's sorry Chris too humble too humble for you <laughs> but I um often at the temple or in a church or elsewhere in society you get you come across really like humble and serviceful people that are really genuine and those people you can tell like a mile off and there's loads of those people at the center and at the local temple here that I go to they're like they're just doing things without any 
need for recognition they're just doing it because it needs to be done and their dedication is just on some incredible level and and i see that in those people you can i can see how uh, how much the service how divine they're making their service and how selfless and how that's really it just comes it's like beaming out of them when they when they serve um which is uh, quite an aspiration uh, for us young ones to serve in that to serve in that way uh, i personally i get very um um bogged down with what i'm doing like i need to do that like if i'm at the center i'm doing something i need to do this uh, but if someone comes and distracts me and i'm like no, i need to do this whereas some people would literally drop what they're doing and just you know be there for the fellowship and yeah, i need to work on all that kind of stuff myself note to self do not disturb priyank <laughs> if you see him at the london center he's in the zone <laughs> no but that's wonderful that you can recognize that as well half the uh the battle is in the recognition right mm. um but yeah i also i love how uh going back to the, the chapter as well how he's just told mukunda this right and mukunda's had this lovely beautiful reaction where he can see this light he's felt this peace and i wonder if from that because he said you know his fear had, had fled that Pranavananda could feel that from him, that upliftment of fear and of, of discontentment, because then he decided to confine, confine in him something else, which is really revealing and really wonderful. And I think if perhaps he hadn't had that reaction, Mukunda hadn't felt that way, he may not have shared this. Um, yeah, which is he, true for us as well, isn't it? Mm, like yeah. Someone... If you're connecting well with someone, you kind of go a bit further. The your mm. conversation is often a bit more intimate. Um, and that happens at a very odd times sometimes, isn't it? With some sometimes completely new people that you may have met in comparison to someone that you've known for 20 years. Yeah. And you suddenly feel that you could, you know, fully express who mm. you are or you can connect with them in a certain type of way. It's really beautiful, actually. Yeah, without into... without fear of judgment. And because then because look, the last line is all fear had fled, Mukunda yeah. says. And then Pranavananda uh, goes even further. That's yeah. Not picked up. So good point. Yeah. And what he does say. Oh, yes, Chris, before we. Yeah, yeah. It, it just was nagging at me to, to say. You know, one thing that I do clearly see and I think is quite commonly referred to is the eyes and the twinkle in people's eyes. You know, you see a spark or some life in the eyes. And equally, when someone's, you know, passed or they're dead, that sparkle dissipates. You know, the life kind of gets drawn out. So the, so the, the eyes are like the windows, the soul is, is, is the way that I think of them, um, uh, which I love, love that idea. And that's quite a common thing, right? So you could maybe look at somebody and see, wow, like there's... A lot of life in those eyes um and maybe that's this this similar divine light being you know coming through that maybe more commonly we see but then this is obviously amplified given the circumstances of of that so yeah it's you know going back to it is maybe quite a real thing quite a real light that you could visibly see mm -hmm. and also i suppose given his self-mastery he was able to pick up on those slight intricacies of other people's feelings it's probably uh easy to be felt as well um so yeah he goes he goes on then to tell Mukunda that uh, a couple of months after he had received this blessing from the Hiri Mahashai he went back to him and he says that he feels that he's no longer able to work in the office because of this divine intoxication right um and Lahiri Mahashai replies and says, apply for a pension from your company. And um, he, he's, you know, asking, you know, how could I, how can I do this so, so early on? And he says, say what you feel. And that really stood out with me because it's that, it's so simple. And often the truths and these lessons that we're being taught, they're so simple, aren't they? And it brings us back to that truth just say the truth uh, and I'd love to touch on this some more because there is such a power in truth but we'll discuss that in a minute um yeah, yeah. in the 
in the business context, this is essentially him telling the truth. This is Brian Avon is literally placing all his eggs in the basket of the guru there, God and gurus, isn't he? Um, because to 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 tell the truth with your loved one <laughs> is usually pretty easy, but to tell the truth in a commercial setting where determining the course of your career <laughs> um, and the next how many years he worked um, is another thing altogether uh, not one that I do very easily I must say that's a bit cheeky as well right so he, he's like not going there and saying oh yeah my guru helped me to go into samadhi and you know, <laughs> kind of focus on work anymore he it sounds more like he describes it like he has like pain in his spine <laughs> which is a common thing for people who work work difficult jobs for a long time right and that's why he gets the tension in the end that at least that's how i understood it when i read it so the technique then would be to um to say it tactfully rather than just <laughs> rather than just being completely like yourself in how you'd speak to your guru say in commercial speak <laughs> <laughs> mm. I mean, he could have gone on for a whole discourse about how he'd been given the doorway to God and union, but he chose the words carefully. And I think you know how people are going to receive you, don't you? So again, he probably felt, you know, the, these are the precise words I should be using <laughs> right now. Then you would have sent him to the insane asylum. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Different type of pension, sick pay. So, what do you think, Chris? A story of Mahatma Gandhi uh, comes to mind where he was in a village or a town and there were lines and lines, queues and queues of people that came, that came to see him. And there was a woman there waiting in the, in the line um, and she had her son with her and the son was overweight. And she said to Mahatma Gandhi, please tell my son to stop eating so many, you know, sweet things and you know, candy and things um, because he's overweight. You know, it's not healthy. And Mahatma Gandhi said, look, come back to me in two weeks. And so they left and she was a bit confused and um, uh, he didn't he didn't tell the, the child to stop uh, eating eating sweet things like she asked. But she did come back uh, and she saw him again. She waited in line again and she asked the same thing. You know, we're, we're back and, you know, I would like you to tell my son to please stop, stop eating sweet things. And so he said, you know, to the boy, stop eating sweet things quite, quite simply. And then the lady was confused. She said, well, you know, hold on. Well, if it was that simple, why didn't you just say that two weeks ago? Like I've, I've had to wait and I've come back. And he said, well, two weeks ago, I was eating sweet things. <laughs> and I don't know, it's, it's you know, a little bit, you know, um, it runs parallel, I think, because the, the reality is he had to live the experience before he was able to tell somebody else to do something. And in this case, you know, the likes of us, you know, if we were, say, I don't know if you tell me, if you were having this experience at home, you were fully intoxicated, you know, in, in Samadhi states, that's fine to then go in and ask for this. But if you're not, don't go in and ask for it because it's not true. You know, it's not, it's not the reality. It's not the truth. So the, the, the living the reality is the important thing in this mm -hmm. case, because otherwise it just would never have been able to manifest this, this reality that he, he so desired. That's the difference also between a genuine guru and uh, one who's just guru by name. Because you know, Gandhi in that scenario, he can't give, he doesn't want to give advice to what he can't even follow himself, right? Such a beautiful yeah. example. Mm. Yeah, I also think once you reach the state in your development, that kind of um, world bends to, to your will a little bit or God is much more likely to bend the world in your favor. And so I think you've taken the red pill, you're kind of out of the whole thing, right? So there's no um, reason for you to, to go to work and have all those experiences if you have another mission that God tells you to do, right? Uh, Yogananda was often trying to run away to the Himalayas, but he was brought back time and time again. And here we have... Pranavananda, very he must have an extremely good bank of karma and you know his path is different he's he's not uh, a guru as such as yogananda chose to be and was assigned uh, by god to be um, but he, he would have had a, an amazing bank of karma 
you know, established there to be able to kind of disengage from the earthly world as such, because I think that's kind of reserved for for the for the select views as far as I'm aware. Yeah. So in the in the in the timeline, at this point, it says later in the footnote, he wasn't yet um, realized, essentially, he wasn't as he wasn't established in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Um, but later he became that after he had this retirement and became a fully illumined master as Guruji calls him and at that point he had disciples and um, uh, later on in the in chapter 27 they talk about um, his his basic ashram and I was actually this close to going to his ashram but I didn't go in, in Rishikesh mm. wow so interesting that would have been yeah really nice to be be around yeah, yeah. But going back to the said chapter, um, so he says, at work, I find an overpowering sensation rising in my spine. It permeates my whole body, unfitting me for the performance of my duties. And the doctor, as you said, Mike, gave him the absolute green light. Go ahead, please retire, which was wonderful. Yes, Priyank? Uh, so the, the sensation in the spine. Mm -hmm. That is uh, one that is obviously very, very important for us practitioners of, of Kriya or the Kriya path, which we're all on. Um, Brother Chidananda did uh, a lovely talk recently on uh, awakening the spine through Kriya Yoga, um, which we'll put a link to in the end, in the in the details. Yeah. Shall we actually talk about now the footnote that is that precedes this? So there is a little footnote if you have a book, anyone listening. Uh, it's very interesting. And I thought actually we could read out a, a little piece of it because it's quite illuminating. So Priyank, would you like to read? So I don't know where, where you are. Uh, the footnote in deep meditation. Um, no, I, I, I will read it. You read it, please. <laughs> okay. It says, in deep meditation, the first experience of spirit is on the altar of the spine and then in the brain. The torrential bliss is overwhelming, but the yogi learns to control its outward manifestations. Mike, would you like to carry on? The time of our meeting, Prabhupada was indeed a fully illumined master, but the closing days in his business life had occurred many years later. He had not then become irrevocably established in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. In that perfect and unshakable state of consciousness, a yogi finds no difficulty in performing any of his worldly duties. Mm. And it's really interesting, isn't it, that you can yeah. be a master of yourself but not be established in Navi Bhagavad Samadhi. That is, to me, I hadn't really picked up on that when I first read it, but when I was reading it again for this podcast, like, that does actually make sense. Um, Mike? In, in higher ages, we need to change our pension system. So for, mm. when people get into Sabikalpa Samadhi, we, they are in a, in a mm. kind of state where they are not fit for office work. We need to kind of give them some time off until they're fully established. <laughs> mm. and it's really good to know. But And um, I, I, I um, imagine this state to be, um, you know, when they say Nirvikalpa Samadhi, you are in this meditational state um, but then when you get up from your meditation and do something else, you lose it, right? You lose that state. So it's not always with you. And only when you're in there because of somebody, it's always with you, no matter what you do, right? Mm. There's always further to go, isn't there? On the mm. pathless path. Yeah, do, you do you think um, that his retirement was how essential do you think his actual retirement was to him achieving that state of nirvikalpa samadhi i reckon it's quite vital so would that, would that then mean that if you were very wealthy and you could afford not to work then you should have no excuses 
<laughs> the thing is, isn't the goal to be able to live in the world but not of it? So, yeah. you know, clearly in, in his path, perhaps he needed to have that space to enable him to release all of his karmic ties and actually fully uh, unionize himself with with absolute spirit but that's not the goal right this mm -hmm. is not what we're taught you know we we're often taught that we don't need to run away to a himalayan cave to find god mm -hmm. he's right here um but it is it is an interesting revelation i i would think that at this point you couldn't have stopped him to go all the way because it, it, they often mention this like when you read stories about saints or also in the Bhagavad Gita, when they say like, um, give me father a taste of your love or, you know, and then when, when you ha have that, when you have this experience once, I think nothing in the world can satisfy you at all anymore, right? You don't know, this is the only thing I want from now on. And I imagine he was not very, I mean, work is what it is, right? Like you can love your job or not, but once you meditate and go into samadhi states, you can probably not care less about anything else, I imagine. So I I doubt he would have been a very good employee if he would have had to carry on. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, just imagining him in a meeting. And like, you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes like some people like to like think and close their eyes and, he would actually be closing his eyes, but his eyes would be rolled up and you wouldn't be able to get out. <laughs> All right, meeting adjourned. So I mean, proud of it is actually again with the divine. You say that though, but in the footnote, it does actually say in that perfect and unshakable state of consciousness relating to Navi Palka Samadhi, a yogi finds no difficulty yeah. in performing any of his worldly duties. Yeah, so this is the catch 22 though. Yeah. Because he, when he retired, he wasn't established in a new state. Mm -hmm. He needed the time to become established. Yeah. He, so he was um, probably in Savikalpa Samadhi, which is the one where you have glimpses, but you can't retain that state. But then uh, the new Vikalpa Samadhi, which is what you described, after you retain that, then he could have gone back into work and yeah. carry on those meetings and mm. not uh, accidentally go into Samadhi and not be able to get out. Yeah. I, I often imagine when somebody reaches some early states, they're basically done their work and the difference between Sabikalpa and Nirvikalpa Samadhi is merely a, a small step. But do you guys think it is a small step or do you think there's still a long way to go and really hard work you have to do before you get from one to the other? I'll let you know when I get there. Yeah. Okay. Tough question. <laughs> Who knows yeah. until you've experienced, yeah. right? And then when you do get there, you probably won't be able to divulge the information. Yeah. Like, is it like is it like going from from having ten billion dollars to a hundred billion dollars? Like it doesn't change your mind a lot or <laughs> your, your your life a lot or does it Well, they say um Hiranyaloka, the residents of the Hiranyaloka planet, where Sri yeah. is, is are only for devotees that have passed the state of Savikalpa to this the new Vikalpa Samadhi oh. states. Right. So right. that would imply that there's lots of people that glimpse Savikalpa Samadhi but don't actually make it to the next state in that life. And hence they have to come back to be reborn, obviously quite elevated because they've already experienced the Samadhi state, but not one that is enough to take them right. and make them a permanent member of the astral world, which is the next world up. It's amazing, isn't it? How far we must <laughs> journey. <laughs> Um, but also what really interests me and is another lesson in this book is that um, Anubhananda didn't get this experience without following his guru's advice to the T. And it does make you think, doesn't it, how fervently and precisely do we follow our guru's advice and teachings? Because without him doing exactly what Vahiri Mahashai asked of him, this would not have happened, probably, in this way. Um, so that's a question I suppose we can all ask ourselves inwardly um, and for anyone listening, perhaps, or outwardly, if you wish to share. <laughs> Mike? I mean, nobody's perfect. I've mm. myself, right? So 
Ah. The, I think I keep mentioning this one, but the, the comforting thing that Guruji uh, has mentioned is um, just do one percent of the things I teach you, and you will reach God. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, but doing all doing all the things is very like I feel like everyone is different, right? And for some people, certain things are easier to apply than other parts of the teachings. And I feel like it's better to I mean, you should not ignore your weaknesses, but if you have strength, I think you should focus on them and just keep keep working at them and make make them better. Um, because I feel like it's probably how you make more progress. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Pranabhananda noticed his weakness, didn't he, in not being able to do his work. So he goes to his guru's feet and asks. And as they say, if you don't ask, well, you might not get so <laughs> um that's lovely and what he also pays homage to Lahiri Mahashai and he goes on to say I know the divine will of Lahiri Mahashai work through the doctor and the officials and your father in order for this to happen so he really pays that due back he he, know, he knows that's where from whence it came yeah Priyank yeah I, I think Guruji writes somewhere that um it's um, a staggering the amount of things that people don't receive because they don't ask. Mm. Um, yeah. And this is such a simple, seemingly simple request, you know, give me a, can you give me an earlier time? And, but people don't, wouldn't necessarily ask or wouldn't, wouldn't go to God with that because they think, oh, it's a materialistic or a worldly, worldly thing. Why I can't approach God with something like that. And you have someone who has mastered their willpower enough to um, get into the state of Savikalpa Samadhi, right? And this guy keeps churning the ether to get an early retirement. It's probably also really hard to deny him that. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. You are right, Priyank. It's so easy to think, oh, this is too worldly. Uh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't go with that question or that request, but it's true. Um, it's amazing, really, isn't it? And then interestingly, in the chapter, he reveals all of this, which is wonderful. And then he retires into one of his long silences, uh, which is interesting. And uh, what, what, what might he be doing? He's probably in Samadhi again. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? But Priyank earlier. Oh, yes, Chris, before I go on to that, yes. Yeah, it, this moment. I. Uh, I think um, looking at the text we have now about Yogananda and hit the later parts of his life and when he was in you know, deep states of samadhi, you know, the people around him were a little bit like, you know, fearful. Wow, you know, my, my guru is in this state. You know, we, we had that from Sri Dai Mata. Um, so going into these long moments of silence and attuning yourself with, you know, the Divine Mother or, you know, the, the, the universe, um, is something Yogananda will go on to do himself uh, and other people will then be in his position that he's in now and witnessing it and being in that in that presence really I think in this sense would have helped him uh, uh, evolve and and he's telling us that story so we're evolving through through uh, his experience which is um, I suppose the purpose really uh, but it's just interesting then how the the roles will be reversed later on in his life and I'll oh, go into these states on many occasions with people who come to him for advice and come to come to him for for learnings. Mm. And just being in that that space with him as well would have been quite chain uh, life changing. Um, Priyank did actually put on our question cards earlier. Do you ever retire to a long silence during meditation? Doesn't count. So e.g. a pilgrimage or some sort of silent retreat but I'm intrigued actually I didn't think to ask this question but this is a great question so do any of you do this yeah Mike yeah so with my with my friends here when when we go to a, a long three-hour meditation or something like that we usually drive home silently mm. and don't talk to each other anymore or I try like Usually after long meditations, I try to keep the silence. There's also those, like Priya mentioned, silent retreats. 
and I find them great as well. And I love how everybody, like you know, you go to a to a temple like Hollywood or Lakeland where they conduct them, and everyone is very mindful of each other, and nobody's speaking, and everything still works really well. So I'm I'm a big fan, and it really helps you to keep the peace inside. Mm. So those are the, um, if you will, a manufactured silence. Um, but in, in this case, and my question um, was that, you know, it's Swami Prananda, he's just relived a couple of divine experiences, or the most important experiences in his life, um, at which point he obviously had to close his eyes because words couldn't do justice for like the feeling that he had so that is the that is the essentially that um the silence that i was talking about and um i think there's there's two or three ways you can have it why like one one is that um in if you're blessed enough to you know be that emotionally um not emotionally but energetically connected to a, div a divine experience that you've had in the past or like, or with with your guru, then essentially, then you would you'd have to withdraw, wouldn't you? If you were having, if you even if you're in like at work and you had this experience, um, you wouldn't be able to then just carry on your um, conversation or your work. You'd have to go and take a walk and reflect and go into the silence. So there's that um, that element, and this is obviously what's happened with Swami Pranavananda. And the second or third um, second way, I think, is. Um, is um when you um actually experience experience like a really blissful state because of some some being in some presence and uh, that presence can be a guru or um or a pilgrimage site so if you're if you go to um a pilgrimage site such as mother center or Gailash, which i've um been to um a number of times uh, then you you'll also get that feeling where like words words will actually sully the moment or spoil the moment for you, for you and then you'll have to even if someone's next to you and they want to have a conversation you'll say please just let us you know share this let us enjoy this moment that it doesn't need doesn't need words and actually words make the subtle moment actually make it gross and bring it to a it's such a it's such a beautiful moment that it's actually taken down to a lower notch by saying oh isn't it beautiful here oh what a wow so peaceful and you're like oh yeah we know all these things you can feel it you probably see it in my face um we don't need to say so that in that in that moment you'd again go you'd you'd probably very naturally go into a seclusion um, and that would, that would be the, the best thing you can do because um, you want to stay in that state for as long for as long as possible. I totally understand uh, what you just said, Priyank. Like I think all of us had this those moments where we felt great peace inside, and then when you start talking, you kind of get out of it or you lose it partially, right? And you you try to not not um like guruji calls it in the lessons like to spill the milk right after meditation that you that you have gathered slowly and i guess that's the difference between nirvikalpa samadhi and not right because once you're in nirvikalpa samadhi you can talk as much as you want and you will never <laughs> lose the peace <right? laughs> yeah no I've, I've questioned myself whether or not i should say this uh, it might land me in trouble but uh, I, I have this almost every day where after periods of meditation in the morning, especially in the morning, um, because I work at home, you know, I'm with my wife, there's stuff to do. There's things to, you know, life uh, decisions to make and conversations that need to be had. And I always try to resist <laughs> having them. <laughs> so my wife, you know, and I were in the morning time. We need we need to hustle. We need to get things things ready. Um, and I always resist, resist, resist. And, and, uh, I think it's just something that, um, learnings, you know, always need to be taken in, in, a, in a relationship, um, uh, to plan better, to maybe give yourself that space after the meditations. But my wife and I do talk about this sometimes where I just want to, you know, be silent and she's, you know, really, you know, wanting to have a conversation that we need to have. So, 
um, but that's uh, that's maybe slightly different different matter. Um, I wonder I wonder though if you know scientifically we can describe why this is because the brain <clears throat> has different wave states, and they talk about you know the alpha, the theta, the bet the beta, theta different stages i can't remember all of them off the top of my head in order um but uh when you're in the deeper states of meditation you're in those deeper states of the brainwave and it's not quite as fr frenetic as far as i understand so it might li literally be discomfort occurring occurring in the brain where it's very peaceful you're in that peaceful state and you have to go into the the higher uh more active states of brain activity so i think I love this subject because you could look at it from many different ways uh, and we're probably going to discover as we go on more and more about this in a, from a purely scientific material standpoint. Um, so it, it's not just about, you know, some sort of feeling and peace, you know, in some es esoteric standpoint, it's quite a literal thing <laughs> to, to, to my understanding uh, as well. So it's probably got great benefits uh, physically mm -hmm. as well as everything else. I just remembered the third um, example where I've experienced this, where um, you, the the what the the more mundane one, as you said, the feeling of peace, Chris. Uh, like if you have um, um, if you have sometimes a strong recollection of something that's a good memory of a deceased person, perhaps, or some friendship or relationship that you no longer have, but you remembered something absolutely beautiful, um, then then. Also, that, that's the same feeling. You, at that point, you want to like hold on to that. There's a similar kind of vibe, um, and you again want to hold on to that um, that feeling at that point as well. Mm, yeah. And what I love also is that if you think about what's happening here, Anubhananda has gone into that really deep, beautiful silence, and then little Mukunda, as a young boy is so in tune with what that must mean that he doesn't rush in and you know say oh well, thank you so much and all of this language he reverently touches his feet and goes to leave he knows that language is not necessary here he, and in doing so he describes that he gets a blessing which is beautiful um and Pranabhananda says, your life belongs to the path of renunciation and yoga. I shall see you again with your father later on, which does become true. I'm interested why he called this a blessing, um, too. It, it's interesting. When I read it, I feel that it's, um, it's like a statement of fact, you know, like it's almost like an affirmation, like th this is going to, it's like a prediction. This is going to happen. But uh Yogananda sees it as a blessing, which is wonderful. What do you feel, Priyank? Considering his heart's longing for the last, since his birth, this birth, he of this resurrection, um, he has just his, you know, he's been focused on the single pointedly on Divine Mother and the spiritual path and Himalayas and Himalayan yogis. So when when that is your um, you know at the forefront of all your actions and your thoughts and your feelings and then you have a uh, very clearly a illumined master such as Pranabhananda and you've actually physically seen his prow you know spiritual magnificence and prowess then and he says the, these words it's just it would be such a comforting <laughs> mm. such a comforting thing it's like um you know the gross the gross way of like when a loved one says i love you you know in a gross way you need to sometimes hear it even though you shouldn't really need to hear it it should be present in your relationship and actions but as a young which obviously in, in mukunda's case it is present in you know inside himself he knows that his life belongs to renunciation yoga but it's like he's a child and is this is outwardly confirmed by a master so he obviously mm loves that he must have loved that feeling and when he um you know as a youth he um you know he, he had that vision of or the manifestation of um lahiri mahashaya came to him when he was 
you know, walking with his brother. And he said a similar thing to him, right? And again, he then, Mukunda went, you know, retreated into the silence and meditated and took out the picture of Lahiri Mahashaya and went through the similar sort of experience there too. knows really well how to behave around those big things Yogananda does even though if you're a reader of the autobiography of a yogi and don't have that much context you feel like this is the first encounter in his life with a big sage right um but then you could say his parents were actually big sages and Priyank mentioned that there was also Lahir Mahashaya who appeared to him because I was thinking if I go to someone's house and I talk to them and they retreat into silence I would be like okay that's awkward like what? <laughs> um, but he didn't have that kind of um, thoughts at all for him this was all very natural and he kind of um, felt the like right from the beginning he felt the peace that brought up uh, uh, Swami Pranabhananda was emanating and he was in tune with it completely. So it, it, for him, this was all a very natural encounter and nothing strange about it. Mm. Um, the other thing we should note is in India, like buys, you know, goodbye and those kind of like manner type things, manners and things aren't really there. So after you've <laughs> often, you, after you've done your business you don't say thank you thank you is not a thing <laughs> you just, everyone's thankful so you don't need to outwardly say thank you um, and similarly with goodbyes um uh, just you just walk away <laughs> that's amazing um, I, know I love like, that <laughs> yeah it's uh, quite a weird one to get your head around when we're you know talking from UK where this would be the, the height of rudeness wouldn't it not oh yeah <laughs> he just left what <laughs> without saying a word you'd be so baffled <laughs> what did I do <laughs> to, to deserve this um yeah and similarly with you know I love you you know these things there's there's no you don't say these there's no, the language doesn't have these kind of words for um your loved one <laughs> yes. you'd have it you'd have it for your guru perhaps or for god but um the husband and wives don't go around saying i love you oh, i love you too mm. and... i suppose when when you feel something so intensely like we said before language doesn't do it justice there aren't the words so i suppose if you are either feeling that in that intensity or if you're if you're living in a culture like india where you probably are more in touch with your emotions. Uh, I hate to generalize, but you know that you you don't need to say goodbye. You just leave because you know that that's been a wonderful time. And you know, I, I think that's wonderful. What do you feel, Mike? I want to play a bit of devil's advocate here because there's also sections where Guruji says that love doesn't exist unless you express it, and not everyone has this intuitive power to. To know, like, you know, Guruji describes so many times how he felt the love from his guru, Sri Yukteswar, without saying anything, but then he still made him say it. Mm. And I think it, it happened mm. twice, and each time was a momentous moment that he described in this book. Um, so there's, I think there is power in there. I don't, yeah, but it's, it's like what you guys said, it's not always necessary, right? If, if mm. it's clear, anyways. Yeah. And um, I think it was, the the deeper concept is rather than I love you, is it that you have become love or loving, um, and then it's not restricted to you and I. But in 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 that examples, Mike, where we're talking about where he actually asked Lady Ma, so he asked Sri Yukteswar to say I love you. Um, it's I I can't imagine because <laughs> they would have been speaking Bengali. And I'm can't I can't imagine what Gujarati equivalent words there are to request that, to, to request that. If I if I say it, it just sounds so ridiculous in my heart. It's not a language that you wouldn't say that to anyone. You wouldn't say it to your mum or your husband or wife, the literal translation of 
do you love me say uh, say you love me it's just, it just it's, um, it would be so amazing to see to, uh, to like if you ever read anywhere what the actual bengali like words were in that moment i know we'll never get it but uh, it's just something that uh, if i ever meet guruji or sri Yukteswar, i think that will be high on my list of questions isn't there a bengali version of the autobiography of a yogi yeah, but even that, that would have been translated from English, right? Mm. And say, say, say if you if you say I love you to God, um, you can say it with with just those three words, or you can feel it. And it's, it's more often it's a feeling, isn't it? It's a feeling of devotion and expression of your gratitude. Like um, similarly, like when you know in this in this uh, section of the chapter, Swami Pranavananda after. After Lahi Mahesh, I gave him this divine experience. He went and went to say thank you, um, and he went with a you know gratitude of you know devotion and offering offering his you know heartfelt you know thanks um, to to his guruji. But he didn't actually. I doubt he would have said thank you because <laughs> mm. in India you don't have this you don't have this mundane um, uh, exchange. He would it would have probably just touched his feet. As a symbol of thanks, or offered him flour or sweets, or you know these these very symbolic gestures for something that's so profound as thank you or I love you. I don't know if I'm making myself very clear, but I'm I'm quite mm. uh, intrigued by this. Uh, what would have actually have gone down? Yeah, if only we'd have been there to see it <laughs> in these yeah. bodies in this lifetime. Um, and then interestingly, after that. Uh, he goes off with uh, Kadarnath Babu, probably pronouncing that wrong, but I gave it a go. <laughs> um, and he gave him his father's letter, which was the whole purpose of this trip. And we're brought back round in this cyclical motion, um, <laughs> which I, this is like such a sweet little description. He says, which my companion read under a street lamp because it, it had grown dark outside. And that was the only way he could he could read this letter. Um, and the contents of the letter basically said that um, he, his father was offering him a position in the Calcutta office in the railway company. Um, and this part baffles me, I have to say. We've had this really divine, miraculous moment in life, right, for these two souls where they've just witnessed a saint in two bodies and all of this has come together. And then... Kadar reads this offering from Yogananda's father, and he says here that he won't leave Banaras and basically is, is, won't, won't be taking him up. And <laughs> I just think if that happened to me, I would be so open to everything that just went on. I think, well, yes, obviously, if, if I'm being offered this, it must be connected with this experience but perhaps that's just my own human nature. Um, but I do find it interesting how he says, you know, yeah, it's impossible. I cannot leave Banaras. Alas, two bodies are not yet for me. And that, that, that. Um, very interesting that that happened. What do you think, Mike? I, I think two things. Like one is um, the point of view that you just described. And the other one is that he's probably also a very spiritually inclined person, Kadarnath Babu, and he might have found his guru or his kind of spiritual environment that he was looking for mm -hmm. in Benares. And that's, I assume that's the reason why he cannot, um, why he cannot leave Benares. Mm. Lauren, you know, you just said that uh, if, it, if this happened to you, you'd have been open to it. You know, I mm -hmm. talked um, last time about the uh, Indian mindset versus the Western uh, oh. mindset about taking these opportunities and moving homes and all this kind of stuff that chris has chris has done and how i said like indians the indian mindset is exactly what killer uh, okay. <laughs> even, <laughs> even if your guru even if your guru has instructed you to come across town you're like oh well, my you know my mom's here my family my friends here my work right. here my education mm. here. all these mm. all these like things that really actually none of them need you but you need to you seem to seem to like this is you know this is this is what I'm meant to do right now. So this is what I will do or should do. Mm, that's true, isn't it? You do forget that you're reading 
as this person, you are reading this book through your own lens of experience and conditioning. Um, yeah, I hadn't even considered that, Priyank. That is a very, very good point. Yes. <laughs> to what you said there at the end, Priyank, um, that oh, this is what I'm meant to do, you know, it's that sense of purpose, right? It, it essentially is what drove me to kind of do the little things I did that, you know, move. And I think uh, Mike's probably an even be better example um, th than me in some ways, right? You've moved around the world. And, um, it's, you know, the sense of feeling at home anywhere is probably a little bit different to what you're describing, Priyank, uh, in terms of the the the, um, the motivations. But yeah, the, the sense of purpose is, you know, where God places you. So in that sense, it's the same thing, right? So if you feel, hey, God's placed me here with to take care of my family, to do something like that. It's, it's essentially the same. So maybe, maybe it's not too different after all. Um, no, you're, you're spiritually elevated, Chris and Mike. Don't do yourself enough... Yeah, uh, yeah enough justice uh, gypsy i'd rather describe myself as a, more of a gypsy because <laughs> indians indians are very weighed down by this concept of dharma and this is what education looks like this is what a wife looks like this is you know what a relationship with your parents looks like and all these things they're not uh, very amenable to change shall we say too weighed down possibly just to go back to lauren what you were saying there, i do uh <laughs> empathize with what you're 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 saying initially that you know how, how can you go from witnessing such uh yeah. miracles yeah. something so grand and vast and then essentially be so rooted you know to the ground at the same time but maybe it's that the what seems supernatural and divine and magical is actually quite normal you know it's it's that's actually our true state and everything else mm. is a bit Kind of off or you know not not quite fitting with our true nature so you know maybe once you experience something like that you know it does maybe there's a feeling of normality to it because that essentially is our true nature mm. and then we kind of go back and we still get caught up in the maya so maybe it's there's something there that was wonderful chris yeah um at the end of this thing this dialogue he says alas two bodies are not for me um not you... yet not yet <laughs> not yet for me yeah. um do you think that he has really with that statement it's obviously a comical reaction uh or not a reaction the statement uh, is in terms of relating it to what's happened but this would have been the single probably one of the most defining moments of his life if that was the case for you would you be able to make a joke about that very thing three seconds later i personally i don't think i i would sure. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you would there's you know uh truth kind of hide, hides behind great jokes in a sense and you know, i don't know i think guruji guruji does say don't try not to you know joke around too much right uh, <laughs> you might, you might lose the sense of are they are they his exact words chris don't uh, try, try, try not to <laughs> i think he, that's in the lesson somewhere right um uh, to mm. to not uh, yeah disturb your the peace essentially disturb your mm. the balance you know by joking around and doing things too much so probably not would be the best <laughs> way forward for it, but do you, you like to? You know, I I would I physically wouldn't be able to do it because I'd be so moved. Mm, yeah, I can imagine myself being so moved by that scene, um, and the letter and all those things that I I'd I'd yeah I wouldn't be able to. I'd be gobsmacked. No, I would for hours at least. Mike is looking very pensive for anyone who's yeah, not watching and who's really listening. So. It, there's really many ways to look at the situation, right? Because if you are in there and you have your life set, and Priyank said that's like the Indian default mindset that everything is set in place and you don't like change. But if you go in there with the seeker mindset, and what just happened is you you are you went to the house of this sage and he performed a miracle for you, and at that same encounter you get this letter with a job offer which probably would elevate your career and make you move to the big city and stuff and you turn it down without much trouble yeah i, I don't know that you could look at this like that as well either either way either either he 
is already on this kind of spiritual path where he feels like this is more important than any worldly goal that I have. Um, or, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 I think I, when I read it the first time, I was thinking that, but now I'm kind of conflicted. Now it could be either. Would you like say that for the sheer fact that Bhagavati sent his son on the journey on his own his, his avatar son yeah his avatar son of all of all of his sons <laughs> <laughs> all that way to deliver hand deliver you a letter would you at least consider it at least say hey okay i'll i'll come and talk to you about this but but then we're looking at that through the lens of our modern mm -hmm. modern eyes say where you can't just pick up the phone or drop a text uh, mm -hmm. email contact in some way um, where it's easy for us today like but maybe that was just the done thing then you know people simply hand delivered letters and it was a bit more yeah commonplace so maybe you wouldn't ap apply as much credit to is what we would today if somebody hand delivered you a letter it's usually you know something very formal and something to really take take uh, into consideration if um coming back to the joke how do you guys take um jokes <laughs> uh spiritually speaking so if i uh if i made this joke mike to you about you know i'm gonna, I'm gonna one day i have to you know something if i made some sort of joke in this way would you would you uh laugh would you be like don't, don't joke around there's like scripture where you're talking about scripture that you're reading here and you're making light humor out of it or would you just brush it off or what mike i I appreciate humor a lot, and especially when it comes out of difficult decisions or difficult situations. Um, I mean, sometimes humor can be used to disguise your true feelings, but um, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person when somebody tries to make me laugh, I love that. I, I feel like life is way too earnest as it is, and all all humor is always appreciated and but even so, guruji related yeah. autobiography related humor especially that oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on a principle yeah, <laughs> yeah. So if uh, if um somebody's working out you're at the gym and you go up and make them laugh they're not <laughs> going to be able to do the few things at once you know if they're bench pressing you're making them laugh they're probably not going to be able to to to, you know, to press and there's something to that where you're you're loose, the tension's kind of out of the body, and it's healing in in some way. And to your point, Mike, you know about comedy um, and about serious situations, uh, it can be very healing for people. You know, just joke. But if you're talking about scripture and does that belittle it? There's many religions that you can't you cannot do that. <laughs> but uh, but I, those I make like, the funniest jokes, though, Chris. Well, exactly. <laughs> but I'd like to think Guruji uh, has a very great, you know, very good sense of humor. So um, maybe consult Guruji over this one. Mm. Something I just thought of was that for me personally, when I read this, it did feel quite jovial and up, you know, uplifting and lighthearted. But actually, who's to say it was a joke? What if he genuinely was like, alas, two bodies are not meant for me yet, and that is why I cannot come? He could have meant it in that way. We don't know. I mean, it feels comedic and lighthearted, but maybe that's because we come from a society where we make a lot of jokes. <laughs> he could have been quite earnest in his, you know, well, you know, I'm not advanced yet enough to have two bodies, so I can't actually come, you know. And we find humour in that because it, we come from this society, right? But he could have genuinely thought well no i'm not able to do that yet so sorry um yeah chris what do you think living in brazil learning portuguese you know you're i'm talking to the locals talk, talking to people here they would say the the uh portuguese the uh, people uh, in portugal are very literal in how they speak compared to the brazilian way of speaking in portuguese so for example i went into a cloth uh, store in Portugal in Lisbon one one day with my wife and we asked the lady do they have a certain type of bed sheets for clothing and the lady 
responded yes. And that was it. That was the full stop. Then we said, sorry, can we, can we see these? Can we see these <laughs> items, please? And you had to really kind of go on the process. So that was my experience of actually there might be truth in this literal way of speaking that is very alien to to you know maybe the English um English speaking ways. So poss possibly, Lauren, you, you know, mm. language is very deceptive in that in that sense. Yeah, it is. And it's interesting also because that's where the chapter ends. So we end on this, you know, it's not yet for me, finito, um, which is actually a lovely way to end it because it feels very definitive um, mm. for me at least um, and felt like a lovely way to end it. Yeah. Yeah. The only other thing we didn't really discuss in any detail was um, the fact that after you had this divine experience, um, Swami Pranavananda, he went back to his guru to say thanks in some way. Um, so he went back, and that's what this chapter talks about. So oh, yeah. this verse goes and talks about to say thanks. I was just wondering, mm -hmm. perhaps we could discuss that a little bit, the the convey the, the importance of conveying gratitude for the material and spiritual gifts that you receive as part of your you know life um personally i I've, I've embedded it into my opening prayer that uh, that i do every morning so i give thanks to my my health my wealth the love you know that uh, surrounds me and the opportunity that i have to love you know in the world obviously many parts of the world that are in conflict and things like that and i uh, don't have such an easy you know, outlet for that kind of thing. Um, so that's why the the other part of it is um, the, it, we, the 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 worldwide healing affirmation that we you know prayer service that we have is also part of that thanks because you're as part of your gratitude and you know your own volition you're giving that you're trying to spread that peace and that joy that you've nurtured in that relation in that uh, meditation etc and giving it to the world to try and make some influence in a way any way that you can yeah mike i think gratitude is a very powerful tool to make your own control your own mood and control your own attitude towards life because once you it kind of turns everything into a positive light gratitude and that's why it's so important and especially gratitude to the guru because the way I imagine Guruji is that he constantly is intervening in my life and trying to save me from things that could happen and make things happen that otherwise wouldn't. And he's like a 24 hour miracle worker <laughs> and constant gratitude for that is um, very important. And it helps to, when you're on the spiritual path, it helps you to keep going this gratitude because it kind of reinforces your kind of longing and your your, your love for the guru. Um, and that's that's one thing that I found is kind of part of the fabric a little bit um, more um, when I moved from Europe to the, to America. I feel like, especially where I grew up in Austria, there is this tendency often to complain about things like whatever it is, complain, complain all day long. And here you almost never get this. Here you have everyone have this attitude that they are grateful for what they have. And it's very beautiful and um, contagious and creates a virtuous cycle in your mind. I was in California in 2012, I think it was, Mike. And I hadn't been to the US before. And I found the people there almost naively positive <laughs> so, Irish, and all of our friends we were constantly bantering with each other and joking with each other and and the folks there in california kind of thought like what you know how, how is this a way to communicate to each other but but they were so like you said like very optimistic you know grateful individuals there's something very you know very very uh inspiring about about how the people are in california and in the u.s 
I do agree with you there. Um, I, I think about it in a way, gratitude, um, in, in, in as much as the pursuit of happiness will almost almost keep you in that state, never being in happiness, but always pursuing it. Gratitude is that acceptance or acknowledgement of having something. So, you know, to thank Guruji for being with you, for blessing you, it's you're acknowledging the reality of that. Uh, and that's, there, there's something very empowering about, about that, isn't there? That it's not the lack thereof or the pursuing of asking you, asking your Guruji to be with you, asking your Guruji for, you know, for assistance and guidance or something like that. It's thanking him for, for, for that being the case and pulling that reality, you know, toward you in, in, in a sense or acknowledging the reality that is already there that you might not be fully, fully aware of. Um, it is a really powerful thing that, reminder to myself do more mm -hmm. <laughs> ask more and do more at the same time mm. i guess also the gift of infinity can't be given to an ungrateful heart if you if you're not thankful for the blessings that you currently have why would the creator of all give you the most supreme gift of himself just a, a food for thought there but I have to say it was so beautiful hearing all of you talk about gratitude is made my heart feel so full <laughs> so yeah thank you for sharing that with us um and that actually concludes the end of chapter three in its entirety it's been quite a chapter hasn't it this one um very very revealing full of miraculous things and I'm really, really looking forward to chapter four, I have to say. But before we end this episode, we had an interesting question asked uh, that Priyanka's done some digging and uh, is going to speak more about, but it was on astral bangles. I'm very intrigued about this. So Priyank, would you like to speak about this? Yes, uh, I'll do that. Um, just about the chapter the end of the chapter mm. um the i i thought um uh, again i completely forgot how much the uh, lady marsha was part or pivotal to this chapter so it seems virtually every chapter to, to date has the first three chapters have been core the core is about the lady marsha mm. and um i in my mind i always thought oh it's such a shame we don't know much about lady marsha you know through this where we've got this beautiful you know guru disciple relationship about him and we don't know much about uh lady marsha and we know virtually nothing about babaji um but now yeah if you, if you dig dig deeper as we are doing in this podcast uh guruji weaves in mm. lady marsha magic into uh the, the into these chapters very beautifully um, in much of a more beautiful way than if you just talked about all of these things in the Lahiri, the Christ-like life of Mary, Lady Marsha. If you talked about all of these in that chapter, it wouldn't have been as memorable as it, as it is when he's talking about here, like his disciples, you know, and their interactions with him. So I thought it's a really quite a nice way of including Lahiri Marsha things. Mm. It feels very autobiographical of many different people. Which mm. I guess also alludes to the title a yogi, or each mm. were a yogi, they are one. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a really lovely point, Priyank. Yes. Yeah, that um that point was actually brought up in the preface uh, mm. that you're talking about there, Lauren, about yeah. the yes. this is the autobiography mm. of you know yogis, almost everybody except Guruji in in a sense that Guruji really puts himself um uh, out of the picture to to an extent and kind of brings in a lot of other people pretty awesome mm. um we also didn't um didn't quite finish on the footnote stuff if i may finish ah. on that yes, yeah please so do. there's a couple of things that are important i would say so firstly um we can talk about the prana of gita so um Guruji says that uh, Swami Pranavaranda wrote uh, wrote a wrote a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita and entitled it Pranav Gita. The Pranav is obviously his first name, so it's his rendition of the Gita, and um, it's quite uh, quite lovely. I uh, managed to find an English translation to his Bengali and Hindi 
translation so a translation of a translation um so yeah i found it um and i found some cool things so i thought i'd uh, share we can share the link to to that to that gita um so the first thing that i found is that he yeah mike sorry um i was wondering if the, um, th those things are mentioned because later yogananda made them part of his uh gita commentary or the those kind of point of views that were expressed there, because it says that Lahiri Mahashai worked on the Gita, um, Pranavananda worked on the Gita. We all know that Sri Yukteswar was a great scholar of the Gita, right? So he was maybe gathering all their work as well when he kind of wrote this Gita commentary. Maybe. Um, gathering, I don't know. Um, maybe. Uh, certainly he would have been able to do it through the ether. <laughs> Um, especially after his own experience in cosmic consciousness, you know, is one of the lines of the famous poem is thoughts of all men past, present to come, um, you know, are there. So he would have uh, potentially not even needed this manuscript <laughs> uh, with Hindi translations. But I did, um, as I say, I did manage to go through some of it. And um, I'll just talk briefly about some of the most interesting bits. He's got um, a really cool page, a couple of pages on the different splits of the Bhagavad Gita, which is quite cool. As I, so he's, I like, for example, I'm I'm on chapter three right now, um, and um, uh, the first the first chap the first verse talks about the previous verses, you know, and then I was like, oh my god, it's so long, but I'd forgotten what the previous chapter was about. So this in in his Brahman of Gita, he's basically um, summarized what each chapter each chapter is about um and then he's also split the whole of the 18 chapters into three dif distinct things i uh, the first uh, the first six is about matters of pertaining to karma and actions that you shouldn't shouldn't take next six is about devotion to, to god and gurus and the last six is the you know divine spiritual uh, knowledge and wisdom um which is pretty cool um so i'm gonna i've actually printed that out and now i've kept it with my gita <laughs> <laughs> so I can reference, go back and forth because you can get lost, as you well know. Mm. In, it's uh, a wonderful read, isn't it? As well, yeah. yeah. Summary. It is because you can get lost. It's so easy to get lost in scripture, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, because each verse is so powerful. Um, but then you have to, if you're going to scholarly, literally read it, you need to remember the previous and the next verses that are coming and mm. be able to. So it's not an easy undertaking. Um, the other the other thing that uh, was pretty cool was that he talks in the introduction about Krishna as um, the God and the experience within you, and mm -hmm. he and he writes, um, although it is true that 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 great master who imparted the Gita, Krishna, is not in a physical body now, he is within verily every living being in the form of the subtlest of the subtle, the self. He is eternal. He is presiding in all hearts, playing his flute. Because of being, because of being bound by tendencies of desires and desires, and consequently having fallen to the suffocating troubles of worldly life, human beings cannot see his captivating form or hear his enchanting flute. I thought it was really nice. So the, the Krishna is playing his flute but <laughs> inside of our souls, but we're uh, not we're not able to hear it because our ears are smothered with the dirt of <laughs> mm. ignorance and desires and tendencies and all those things. Um, but it's quite cool because in the Aum, Aum meditation technique, uh, part of that technique is about connecting to some certain chakras in the spine and some certain sounds which are akin to that flute. Uh, so it's a quite circular mm. path and is there's is the other thing about reading um uh swami Bhanavananda's gita versus reading say uh iskon Hare krishna gita which you would uh, no doubt someone would have given you it's one of the most distributed because of the way they they, they spread their teachings but if you if you read swami Bhanavananda's gita you'll notice that because he's in our line essentially he's in our lineage right so it's everything that he writes is perfectly consistent with how Yogananda and Lehi Mahashai and Babaji would would you know express these truths. So um, there's no like there's no room for like confusion because it's all 
quite nicely succinct. Mike? Is it, is it Gita well known outside the circles of Yogananda or? or I don't, like I, don't I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so, but I could be wrong. Um, I, and I, I mentioned earlier that um, I went to his, um, uh, I was nearly going to his ashram in, um, in uh, Rishikesh. Um, that's the other thing uh, about this, actually, because, um, you know, you, Swami, about this whole chapter, actually, Swami Pranavananda is, um, he, so you, we get some of Swami Pranavananda in chapter three, which is what we've just spent the last five episodes talking about. And then we get some of him in chapter 27. And in chapter 27, we don't get just, uh, you know, a cursory mention. There's actually a very, very deep dialogue about him and how what happened to him and how he left his body, what, what, all these really deep things. And um, but when, I remember when I first read it, um, there's so many characters between chapter three and chapter 27. <laughs> they all kind of like distant and hazy. Um, so Swami Pranavan is, is a classic one for me. He's, you know, well, I was getting him confused with Swami Geshev, another, or the, the, what's his name? The, the, the sans his Sanskrit tutor, yeah. yeah. Um, and because um, they're all connected, and but they all have a very unique place in the book. Um, so the, the fact that we're doing this, you know, this journey in this way, it's like cement. Now I will know forever Swami Pranavananda because we've gone to him in, in such detail. Um, so when chapter 27 comes, there will be no confusion, <laughs> Mike. Yeah, and there's a few more personalities of that caliber coming in the next few chapters and looking forward to all of them. Because yeah. like you just said, Priya, I also used to conflate them a little bit as I was reading the book. Um, I'm really looking forward to when we reach um, the section with Master Mahashaya, because he's also a great influence on young Mukunda. Mm, indeed. Another cool thing in the in the Gita that um, I read was that he, he's written, many, many think that it is not possible for this great event of the Gita to happen immediately before the time of war is about to take place on a battlefield. Connecting this the Gita being taught with the battle of Kurukshetra is just the imaginings of a poet. In order to make them the doubters understand, we can say just this. Firstly, Krishna is the almighty God. His works are beyond the nature of human beings or beyond the nature of their understanding. On top of that, at the time of imparting the Gita, he was in the yogic state of being. He also put Arjuna in the yogic state of being. In the yogic state of being, activities take place in the subtle body. At that time, one's epoch event can take place in the blink of an eye. Just as in the dream state, one can exp experience a huge event taking place over a period of time that actually takes only one or two minutes in the waking state. Therefore, there is absolutely no reason to doubt the connection of the happenings of the Gita within the battle of Kurukshetra. Um, Pretty profound, isn't it? I, so, much, so much to unpack there. We yeah. don't have to do it now, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I thought I'd just complete this because um, he quotes um, in the very introduction, they quote uh, Lahiri uh, Sri Yukteswar. Um, and, and Sri Yukteswar says um, that... So this is Sri Yukteswar speaking, and they're quoting him. Um, that Gurudev, Lahiri Mahashai, himself wrote any books. This is not correct, and to say so is to actually demean him. He himself did not author any book. What was written down of his words by his devotees while they listened to his spoken commentaries is what has been published in book form. Gurudev's language and manner from time to time were incomprehensible to many, it's not at all impossible that trying to convey that language and manner in the written form could produce some errors here and there. So mm -hmm. so Sri Yukteswar is kind of saying <laughs> these these are you know the books that are published in Lahiri Mahasha's name, of which there is, there are a few. Um, they're actually words that are, you know, he recounted and people writing down. And similarly with this. Geshe, uh, um, 
with Swami Pranavananda's book. He actually didn't write this book. They were just recordings of his um, satsangs, and then they collated them. And of course, there's room for error, which brings to focus the value of God Talks with Arjuna, because God Talks with Arjuna and the Autobiography of Yogi and all of Guruji's work are actually direct writings of Yogananda. So although, you know, Guruji mentions all these different books, um, you know, and uh, that may be linked to our lineage. Um, he mentions them just just to, to, you know, spark our curiosity and perhaps we can glean something from them. But our primary focus uh, would be foolish not to use uh, Yogananda's direct um, words because they're the most, uh, you know, they've been mo they, they haven't been changed, right? And if they have been changed, it's just editorial changes as opposed to someone taking notes from when Guruji was writing. That's a completely different paradigm. So I thought uh, that's an important point um, to end on for that. Um, and the other the other point in the footnote is that he referenced uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras um, and that the fact that the bilocation has been exhibited by many saints. And I found uh, the bilocation um, uh, references in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Um, if, and it's actually, so in the Yoga Sutras, uh, you'll know the uh, eightfold path of the Patanjali's, you know, meditation or the, the, the path to self-realization, which uh, we, we also are a part of that ladder. Um, there's... Um, no, actually, you won't go into it. They, they'll get it wrong. Uh, Chris, can you quote it offhand? Can you quote no, the first one? <laughs> yeah. Anyone? Mike, you can quote some of them, surely. One of them. Yama, Niyama, Asana, uh, Pranayam. You can tell, I'm sure you would have said that one if Pr I'd given Pratyah, you. Pratyahara. Yeah, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, uh, Samadhi. Yeah, so there's uh, the eightfold. I've probably missed one somewhere. There's, there's the eightfold um, yoga, yoga sutra path. So, but in that book, he also says um, about um, relaxing one's attachment to the body and becoming profoundly sensitive to its currents. Consciousness can enter another's body. And then he later on in that same chapter, he says, then extraordinary faculties appear, including the power to shrink to the size of an atom. As the body attains perfection, transcending physical law. So uh, Patanjali and Guruji, as said, describes in that book um, how we can also attain to having two bodies. <laughs> I practice the perfect the meditation techniques that we're, we're taught and the Patanjali's eightfold path. Lauren? I feel like also when he references other books, it kind of gives more assurance to the reader who is questioning if this is maybe real or not. Because if many people are saying the same thing, more likely than not, it is give or take going <laughs> to have some, at least some truth in it. Mm. Here, obviously, it feels extremely at one with truth. Uh, I can't speak for the entirety of creation. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, yeah, I feel like that's also why he perhaps brought other things in, because it adds to that bigger picture of th this is reality, this is real. Much like when he adds pictures in and other things like that, it just brings it closer to home, like this this is this is life, this happened. Um, Indeed. Yeah. Mike? Yeah, it reminds me of that scene in the Awake movie where they, they show Varanasi and then they Say like in a remote corner of Benares, a spiritual renaissance is taking place. <laughs> and, and it's a really nice sentence. And it's also, it's what sparked kind of um, a lot of spiritual movements, not just self-realization fellowship, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I reckon the, uh, for example, um, this book that, you know, where the Swami Pranav's Gita uh, may have been quite popular in Bengal, and where it was popular, uh, there was a Bengali uh, script for it, obviously book printed, and he was quite a popular uh, saint. And um, so saints like Srila Prabhupada, for example, who is the founder of the ISKCON or the Hare Krishna movement, may have picked up that uh, that book. And if you look, it follow, their, their Gita follows a similar sort of way of doing things. Um, so he could have been influenced by it. But 
Well, what I'm essentially saying is if you, if you fancy reading a different uh, um, different translation of the Gita and a different uh, you know explanation of the text, then staying like reading Swami Pranav Pranavananda's um, book is it'd be much much more fruitful as an exercise than to to go off and read the Iskon book or even Gandhi has written um, there's a there's a Bhagavad, there's a Bhagavad Gita under Gandhi's name as well from his discourses even that one would be slightly uh, well it is very different I know I've, I've read it so yeah um, but that's the Gita and the and then they, there's a cursory mention of Theresa Neumann um, as well in the footnote, which which will be later on in another chapter. And <laughs> she was also able to bilocate uh, for her devotees. Um, yeah, that's everything. So going on to the last point now, which is um, so we put on a few episodes ago. We uh, someone said, "Can we ask you anything?" And perhaps you can discuss it. So our first query has come on, and it is about astral bangles. Dun dun dun! I am um, Mike, and I are showing the mm. start of the uh, astral bangle, so, you know, sign language that we have. Look, Lauren and Chris, I don't think have one. So some, yeah. So someone asked, um, "Can you speak about astral bangles? We can't get to them in India, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Hopefully, one day they'll resolve that. But." Um, yeah, we can talk about astral bangles. Um, we can uh, draw on a few different um, resource pools. Um, before we do that, Lauren? Before we do that, my question is, how do you get them? Because they're not available, from my knowledge, on the bookstore. So where does one acquire such a wonderful bangle? So you can get them from... A few places you can go you can get them from any jewelers <laughs> but you wouldn't want to do that and we'll get into why you wouldn't want yeah. to do that um but you can get i got mine um and you can get them from mother center uh, i self-realization fellowships in in um in in la where mike is a stone's throw away <laughs> yeah. um but uh there's pretty, also pretty pretty far throw pretty far throw yeah. <laughs> there's um there's also uh who's that group mike in um sat in down down south near encinitas that uh that that sell astrological bangles and navaratnas um there's a group i will put a link that they they also do them um but uh then you have to get them shipped so i personally have got mine ordered from mother center and then they srf have them made and then and then you have to collect them they don't at the time that I bought them. They didn't. They don't deliver them um, because I don't know. They're so expensive, whatever. So I had to get someone to collect it, um, which was my sister-in-law, and she absolutely loved going to Mother Center. Otherwise, she wouldn't have gone. Mm. <laughs> it was quite nice. She was like, "Who are these ladies in their yellow saris?" You know, mm. <laughs> <laughs> joyful. Um, yeah. So Mother Center is the is the way. And the special thing about getting it from Mother Center is that they leave it. They leave the bangle in Guruji's room or somewhere where he's been on his chair or something like that um, to imbibe some of that uh, that energy uh, of Guruji before sending it to you, which uh, gives you that uh, physical kind of link, I suppose, which, which is quite nice because it is a physical object and quite an expensive one. Um, probably when I bought it, it was quite close to $2,000. I don't know what the price would be now, probably significantly north of that um um yeah so I, I looked up the they send you a little uh note when they send it to you um and it's really about how to wear it um and what to do and what not to do so not much about the science of the bangles um but uh it essentially says you it needs to be worn um on any limb but it has to be touching your skin at uh, at all times and um, it shouldn't um, it shouldn't be put in such a way that it's of any discomfort to you, like you're putting it across your bicep and tightening it <laughs> like they do in um, wrestlers do and stuff like that. But you shouldn't do anything like that. Um, it should just be sitting on your body and you shouldn't really notice it. And you shouldn't um, deface it in any way. And we'll get to why it's about the correct metal weight. Um, so if, if it gets damaged and part of it breaks off, 
then uh, there's some things you should do because the weight is all important and we'll get to that uh, uh, later on. Um, yeah, so that, so that if, if you want to know about the science of the astral bangle, then you actually have to refer to the Autobiography of a Yogi, chapter 16, which is, um, which is, about, is entitled Outwitting the Stars. And in that, uh, Mike, if you open that description, for astral bangles, um, the Mukunda Sri Yukteswar says to Mukunda, "Why don't you get an astral, astrological armlet?" Uh, Mike, do you want to carry on reading? Man, in his human aspect, has to combat two sets of forces. First, the tumults within his being, caused by the admixture of earth, water, fire, air, and ethereal elements. Second, the outer disintegrating powers of nature. So long as man struggles with his mortality, he is affected by the myriad mutations of heaven and earth. The wise man defeats his planets, which is to say his past, by transferring his allegiance from the creation to the creator by a number of means, by prayer, by willpower, by yoga meditation, by consultation with saints, by use of astrological bangles, the adverse effects of past wrongs can be minimized or nullified. Just as a house may be fitted with a copper rod to absorb the shock of lightning, so the bodily temple can be protected in certain ways. The sages discovered that pure metals emit an astral light which is powerfully con uh, counteractive to negative pulls of the planets. Certain planet combinations were also found to be helpful. One little known fact is that the proper jewels, metals, and plant preparations are valueless unless the required weight is secured and unless the remedial agent is worn next to the skin. Sir, of course I shall take your advice and get a bangle. I am intrigued at the thought of outwitting a planet. For general purposes, I counsel the use of an armlet made of gold, silver, and copper. And that gold, silver, and copper is the exact one that a lot of self-realization fellowship devotees wear. I think, Mike, you're on your second or third, aren't you? If I recall. Wait. What are you talking about? It's my first one. My uh, first one. <laughs> no, no, it's my second one. Second my one. My first one, I just didn't treat so so well because I, I used to play soccer and the referees, they made me take off the bangle because it is not nice getting struck with a <laughs> bangle, I guess. And so I, 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 when you take it uh, off and put it back on often, then it tends to break, so... The second one I've never taken off since I got it, which same here. Uh, even it... in um, even in airports, I don't take mine off now. They just yeah. uh, a lot. They don't bother. They don't actually yeah. set off the metal detectors a lot of the times. Yeah, ninety percent of the they time. Don't. It's so yeah. weird, even though it's fully made of pure metals. <laughs> wow. Chris. Yeah, interesting how he says for general purposes, I counsel the use of an armlet made of gold, because the the idea there that there's specific purposes that you could have other other metals and used for. Um, and I ha randomly actually heard this very recently, just this week, um, of metals um, in your ear. And in your ear, you know, depending on where you use them can it, and the quality of the metals and the, the type of metals, whether it's even diamond or, you know, whatever the material is, can actually have an effect on you as well so I've, I've never heard that before but just thought i'd throw that in but for the, for this that uh you're going to have to say for general purposes um i'd be interested uh yeah to hear the science behind what the specific purposes that you might use metals for as well mike yeah, unfortunately we seem to be in a time right now where we don't understand the science behind the bangle at all and i don't think gurji went into great detail about what the science really is because he felt probably we'll figure it out at some point but he he did he did feel that it is a, a helpful tool that we should have even in this age so he kind of said 
kind of gave specifications. I don't think they're public, but he gave specifications on what the bangle should be like and so you can purchase it. Unfortunately, these days we are at this time where people like we have like this commodity market and then certain raw materials become insanely expensive. And um, so unfortunately, they have gone up in price a lot over the last 10, 20 years. And hopefully this won't always be like that. There's there's planets out there made of pure diamond, Mike. So don't worry, once once we can start traveling and mining, <laughs> there'll be plenty of material. Yes. Space mine. But, <laughs> but um, Chris, you're absolutely right. Different metals, for different purposes and different materials actually also. Because in that same chapter, uh, Stuk Dishwa says, for a specific purpose, I want you, i.e. Mukunda, to get one of silver and lead, which mm. is a completely different uh, set of, well, different metal and different ratio, etc., cetera, to, um, to the one that SRF uh, accounts on now. Um, and that website, I was thinking it was Astro Gems uh, in Enslintas, I think, um, and their devotees that, that run it. And uh, I've heard good, good feedback from them, and they actually repair them as well. Um, and they know the ratios so they're, they're pretty good um so the other thing um i was going to say was that guruji also or um Suryak Desha also mentions the navaratna and nova means nine nine gems and stones and pearls and what they called it rubies um so that is a really expensive that's the, the all-out one <laughs> that's the one yeah the srf don't produce but you can get um and it costs something insane like thirty thousand dollars because of the because of the specification of them and uh they're very 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 sought after um in india amongst indians um and sri yogdeshwar used to wear one himself um which we'll talk about in, on a later in a later episode um, but as I said, it's not just uh, metals and pearls. There's actually plants. So, for example, we we mentioned the reason to wear them, uh, i.e., to you know counter certain forces and give you yourself so, so give you like a protection. Um, they, in India, we say it kind of stabilizes your body and um, provides support for your sadhana even. Um, but essentially, it acts as a shield. Uh, and the, the word for shield in, in Sanskrit is garbage. And um, from a shield from like negative influences um, that uh, that can that can impact your practices and your life essentially, um, because you know it creates and and meditation. Although like he mentioned meditation also serves this purpose as well, but we t we like to use every tool at our disposal um, because these these metals also help you you know create a cocoon of your own energy. Um, and there's like there's a rule for for sadhus in India, like they they say to to avoid being like you know going down to the lower states of attachment, etc. They they never sleep or put their head in the same place to, in two nights in a row. So they have to they have to move. They can't get comfortable anywhere in any cave, etc. It's a very austere path. But um, the other thing that people also wear for this similar impact is rudraksh, which is what I'm wearing here. Um, and that is sold in um, SRF uh, um, book rooms across the world. <laughs> and uh, it's from India. Um, it's a, from a specific tree, a five-faced uh, seed is a rudraksh. Um, and it's very closely associated with um, energy and shiva and, uh, and um, yeah, specific purpose. And the other, the other uh, material is dulci as well. Dulci is a very... Um, special plant associated with Krishna. Um, and so you get these wooden dulci beads, which I also have um, one from my late grandmother. So it's quite old. Um, I've kept the beads. Um, I actually used to wear that, but then it broke. And then I lost some of the beads. Now I keep it like in my meditation <laughs> meditation room. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's not just um, things that you like metals it's also other materials as well and also other in india we do um <laughs> we do various rituals to counter the impact of these um forces shall we say as well to uh to to proceed and to not be not be held back shall we say so yeah that's a lot of uh talk about astral bangles uh, lauren you're going to get one now I have wanted an astral bangle since I read about it in Autobiography Yogi years ago. So one day it shall be. 
mm. uh, as to when that's up to the god um but yes definitely and chris yeah mike's gonna buy me one i think um <laughs> <laughs> The pay That's what I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Check will be in the post, Mike. Um, <laughs> no, I'm I'm seeing as Lauren. I, I mail I, it. I mail it already. Yeah, I exactly. Should arrive any day. I uh, after first reading it, I, I went online and searching. Mm. Reading it. it struck my curiosity because I've I never realized the the reality behind these things uh, before I, I read about it in the autobiography of a yogi. So it really captured my imagination and um, inspired me actually, you know, that this world is more than just the material kind of dullness that uh, maybe the reductionist might, might have, have us, have us thought it is. So it's a fascinating, fascinating uh, subject, but one day I will, I, I wanted, I want to be in LA mother center and buy it by my name in person. Um, <laughs> covid and everything that's happened recently has been a bit a bit difficult so i'll get there sooner uh rather than later i hope very nice um on that note we can probably end it there mike what can we look forward to in the next chapter chapter four. Oh wow chapter four it's a complete uh different story right now it is uh, mukunda traveling again but this time in the other direction this time he is um, on a mission to seek out the yogis of the Himalayas. Um, he's sneaking away from home and he is aware of his brother Ananta expecting this and trying to hunt him down to see how this, how this goes. And do you think it's just going to be a narrative or is there going to be some deeper spiritual gems inside? Astral oh. gems? We, Easiest question. Covered. We're talking about scripture here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like full of spiritual messages everywhere. <laughs> yes, That's yes. The least hospital passive pass you've. Yes. Yeah, the least. Least. <laughs> Thanks for that, Priya. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll be sure to make it much harder next time. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, Lauren, is that everything? That is. Thank you all for being here and for our listeners as well thank you for sharing this space with us and we will see you for chapter four very exciting um but have a lovely peaceful joyous rest of the week and jai guru jai guru, jai guru.